This is the City of God podcast, where Christ meets culture. I'd like to welcome you to the City of God podcast, which is made in partnership with the Institute for Faith and Culture. John, this is an exciting podcast for us today. We welcome Patrick Bet David to the podcast suite uh, for a really exciting interview. I'm impressed, honestly, Rob, because you uh, somehow became friends with Patrick Bet David, and you know we're starting our little podcast here, and we've got high hopes for it. This is a guy who's a giant in the podcasting world. I looked this up. He's got uh, just on Instagram alone. He has 3.5 million followers, which uh, I, I last time I checked my own Instagram. That would be like uh, two and a half million times as many followers as I have. So uh, he's he, this guy's a, a, an influencer. He's a giant, and he's got an amazing personal story as well. And so you and I sat down and talked with him, and really got to get into kind of a whole panoply of stuff with him. I found it fascinating. Yeah, it, it's amazing. I think it was last summer. Uh, somebody sent me a message and said, "Hey, do you know this guy's going to your church?" Uh, <laughs> and so I quickly looked him up, like you, and saw what he was doing in the area of podcast his entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, he's attending our church as kids go to our school, Westminster Academy. So we've, uh, it's been a great uh, opportunity to get to know him uh, personally and privately and thought it would be a great opportunity to bring him on the City of God podcast, talking about uh, things like immigrating from Iran, being uh, transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, moving from atheism to Christianity, and and so many other topics that we're going to cover. Yeah, he he is a a Christian from Iran, which in and of itself is very interesting, came over uh, to the United States after the the revolution that took place there under the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, at the end of the 1970s. And, And so he has this amazing personal story and also just this incredible ability to communicate, which is what makes him one of the biggest podcasters out there. Just to give an idea of his reach, I already mentioned Instagram on YouTube. I think I looked, they have something like 4 million followers on YouTube. He's regularly been on Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's podcast, for those who don't know, and I can't imagine anybody listening to a podcast doesn't know, but Joe Rogan's is bar none the biggest podcast in the world. Uh, a, a Spotify pays Joe Rogan something like $50 million a year to have his podcast. And uh, Patrick Bedday David's a regular guest of Joe Rogan's and somebody that Joe Rogan cites regularly. And yet he's one of us. He's, he's someone with a Christian faith who's taking it out into that realm. And his Christianity influences his view of the family, his understanding of the next generation and the importance of raising up the next generation and for parental involvement uh, to be a priority. Uh, he's a firm believer in capitalism, uh, yes. has an incredibly entrepreneurial spirit, and all of it is gr- rooted and grounded in in a biblical worldview. So let's not uh, keep our audience waiting any longer. Here is part one of our interview with Patrick Bet David. What are all the different hats that you wear? Because you, I, I was I was going through your bio a little bit. I'm familiar with your podcast, but there's you do a lot of different things. Like if I did any one of these things, I would be exhausted. So what what what, what all do you do? So are we starting? Are we yeah? yeah. We're, okay, we're, we're just gonna roll. Yep. So you know, so for me, you know, born in Iran, we leave. I go to Germany. From Germany, I start my first business, and it was a recycling business. That's how I bought my first Super Nintendo, Super Mario Brothers. It was 249 marks and. I needed 5,000 beer bottles to recycle at five Fennec to buy them. Now, the good thing is Germans drink a lot of beer, which wasn't that hard to find 5,000 beer bottles. Anyways, from there, I uh, come to the States. Uh, parents get a divorce twice. When they get married, my sister's born, they get divorced, then they get remarried, I'm born, then they get divorced. So I have to figure out a way to pay the bills and make some money. Uh, I'm a lunch ticket kid. And then right after high school, I had a one point eight GPA. And I uh, go to the military. I'm in the Army for a couple of years, two and a half years. I go to 101st Airborne Division, Air Assault, have a good time. I get out. And then I wanted to be a bodybuilder. So I'm going to be the next Middle Eastern Mr. Olympia. I'm going to marry a <laughs> Kennedy. I'm going to win bodybuilding. I'm going to go into the Hollywood. American I'm going to be a governor. That's yeah. what I'm going to be. And then it didn't happen. I went into financial services. I married a Hudman. It's a very different route I took with life. <laughs> but uh, so, so, yeah, so when, when, I always liked numbers. So I decided to go apply to work at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. I applied a lot of different places, but Morgan Stanley Dean Witter hired me at 21 
22 years old, without a degree, a day before 9-11 was my first. It was a Monday. Wow. So it's 9, 10, 2001. I go and everybody's excited. People are fired up about the future. Next day, 9-11 happens. Our headquarters in Morgan Stanley, then Witters in World Trade Center, New York. And then next thing you know, the following day is a mess. Everybody's afraid. I get my Series 7, 66, 31. So I've been in the financial services industry since 2001. Okay. okay so that's 21, 22 years. And then I go to Transamerica. After Transamerica, I start my own company, September of uh, 2009, insurance company, PHB agency. We grew it from 66 agents out of one office to now we've licensed 40,000 agents, you know, 49 states, and recently was acquired by uh, uh, IMG and uh, Silver Lake. And 10 years ago, I started creating content accidentally. Part-time, we're creating YouTube, you know, content. We're getting 22 views, 82 views, 70, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Nothing's happened. And two years later, we got a couple thousand subscribers. And then I, you know, get focused on entrepreneurship. And uh, that becomes my content. And then we go to 20,000 subs, 100,000 subs. And then that takes off. We got a few million subscribers now, a few billion views online. And now I'm running multiple. We have a consulting firm that I run. We run podcasts. We recruit talent to do podcasts in-house. We run a product development division where we produce products like Minect. We have a value team and investment group where we raise capital for entrepreneurs. So there's a lot of different things that we do, and we're buying a few buildings here for Lauderdale. So that's kind of what I do for Lemon. All right, let's back up a little. So you're 10, <laughs> let, let's go all the way back. So you're 10 years old when you and your yep. family immigrate to America from Iran. Tell us a little bit about that journey, that right. story. So I'm an atheist for 25 years because when you live in Iran and you see What's going on? I would go to Bible study, uh, Sunday school. They would always kick me out. And my, I would say, hey, if God is so good, why are so many people dying? If God is so good, why are we getting bombed? Why, why is this happening to us? And then in Iran, you couldn't tell people you were a Christian. You couldn't go and say, hey, you know, I love Jesus. I love God. I love this. Your parents would say, hey, guys, just kind of keep it to yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we go to church, but kind of low-key. As long as we're low-key, they won't bother us. But don't be too, you know... Uh, bold about it, and I was never, because I, I had a hard time understanding life, God, all of it. So we go to Germany. I live in Germany for a couple of years. And, you know, the best thing about Germany is, you know the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People? Yeah. I mean, you have no choice but to learn how to win mm. friends and influence people at a refugee camp from people that are from Yugoslavia, from Czechoslovakia, from Albania, from Poland, from Pakistan, from Afghanistan. You're forced to learn Culture Studies 101 <laughs> in a year and a half at 10 to 12 years old. So you kind of learn a lot about that. Yeah, and then from there we come to the States. So that was a very uh, interesting time when my parents got a divorce. I was forced to be almost a man of the household. I had a sister that was six years older than me, but I'm supposed to see who she's dating. You know, when she would go out, I'd go and see what restaurant she's at, what's going on. I had to play that role. The dynamics were interesting, but, you know, all in all kind of worked out. It's amazing. Patrick, I've seen uh, firsthand uh, you and your family. I've seen uh, not only the Patrick in public, but in private as well. Uh, I know your family, your dad, your sister, brother-in-law. Uh, family is super important to you. It's a high value for you and your family. Uh, tell us a little bit about your perspective on the family today, how the traditional view of family is under attack in America. Yeah, it's so interesting you say that. For me, credit goes to my dad. Uh, a big part of that, obviously my mom as well, but my dad was all about family. Since I was six years old, when my teacher asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I want to be a father. Because my relationship with my dad is that great of a relationship that I want to have that kind of a relationship with my kids. Mm. You know, as you age and you get older and you go through your selfish phase, everybody in the world is selfish. We're just some, some are a little bit more selfish than others. Christians are selfish. Atheists are selfish. Everyone's selfish. But it's for us to be aware to say, well, I'm probably 7% selfish. Let me see if I can get take it. And we kind of are always battling with this. So during the teens and young adults, you know, 14, 15, 16, 22, you're only uh, investing your time into things that have a very short lifespan, okay? Partying, going out, Vegas, women, gambling, all of this stuff that are short-lived. Mm -hmm. What I've learned, I was doing a meeting at, the other day at uh, Bay Colony, with this one guy, Raul, who's hosting a leadership conference, and he's got 20 guys in the room who all run a business, 10 to 100 million a year. Very successful. They're all doing good. They're in their 40s to 50s is where they are. And one of the guys says, you know, two years ago in 2021, I netted $10 million. 
But what do I do now, Patrick? I'm rich. I got all the cars. I got this. I got that. And I'm bored out of my mind. I said, you're investing your time into things that have a very short lifespan. A car is going to get old. Yeah, if you want to kind of store it to appreciate a car because it's got, you know, history to it, I can respect that. You know, a house, I was looking at my house this morning. I'm doing jump, jump ropes outside. I'm like, wow, those pillars used to be new. <laughs> They're no, no longer as, <laughs> right. we need to paint those pillars. They don't look good, right? But if you invest in a, a proverb once said, every man ought to do three things before they die. Plant a tree, write a book, have a son. I think it's a Jewish proverb. Plant a, plant a tree, write a book, have a son. Now, what is the premise behind that? If you invest in things that outlive you, the idea is a tree could outlive you, a kid could outlive you, a son could outlive you, a book could outlive you. Today, we're too concerned with investing into things that are not going to outlive us, okay? The reason why family is so important, because what other great high do you have in life but having kids? I was having a debate with uh, a guy that uh, we all know, Mike Rowe, who extremely good-looking guy. <laughs> He's done great for himself. I had him on the podcast five weeks ago, and the, the podcast got uncomfortable at one point. I said, you're a very important figurehead. We all know who you are. The stuff that you've done, dirty jobs, all these shows mm -hmm. that we've been entertained by this guy. Yep. I said, you've never been married. You've never had kids. Why? Right? And you kind of have that conversation. One time I was having a conversation with AIG CFO during the time when Bob Ben Moshe came in to save AIG from going out of business. We're at dinner in Chicago, Ritz-Carlton. And I said, so tell me how many kids do you guys have? He was 49 at the time, 50 at the time. He says, no kids. I said, really? Yeah. By choice? Or, you know, kind of like God was in charge and you couldn't have kids. He says, no, by choice. How long have you been married? 28 years. Wait, so you're married 28 years. You have no kids by choice, not because health. Yeah, by choice. How did this decision come about? Like, how did you guys decide this? Well, my wife and I, pre-getting married, we made a decision that our career was going to be our kid. Hmm. Yeah. She runs a restaurant at a country club, uh, uh, and I went into being a CFO accounting, and now I'm running the CFO, a job that a lot of people would love to have. He's making $10 million a year. He's doing great for himself. Then I'm sitting there by myself. I'm coming up. This is early on in my career. So go back 2011. So we're talking like uh, when I'm starting a company. So this is 11 years ago, 12 years ago. I have a very hard time. I don't have a kid at that. I have a very hard time convincing myself not to have kids. I have a very hard time convincing myself not to go through that, right? Yeah. Now, we all know marriage is hard. We already have a hard time getting along with ourselves, let alone add another person. You have a hard time getting along with your siblings and parents. Yep. Add another person and their siblings. And their, we have a hard time getting along with all our friends, add her friends. <laughs> and then on top of that, let's have kids together. Maybe one, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four. And then you go through a loss of loved ones. I go through a loss of loved ones. We go through a loss of loved ones. And you want me to handle all of this at the same time? Why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Why am I invest? Why not just be selfish and not get married and stay single and not have kids and just make my money and travel and do whatever I want to do? And one day I'm living in Thailand, next minute I'm living this. As much as I try to play the devil's advocate to try to convince myself of that argument, I have a very, very hard time selling that. And I think today, unfortunately, Rob, the same way the feminist argument convinced a lot of women to buy into this concept, and I'm going to get, you know, I get people get upset with me, but I'm very comfortable with that. As much as I get, people will say, well, let me tell you, feminism, you know, with men, we should, we're equal, we should do this and we should do that. I'm putting an event together, a diplomat, a couple thousand people are there. I'll tell this story and I'll uh, turn it back over to you. And first night, I said, I want you guys to be thinking about what big breakthrough you've had so far on the first day, because you have to answer these 40 questions. It's, it's a questionnaire, personal audit questionnaire that everybody's going through. And tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about it. Morning comes up. What are you going to be doing? Wife gets up. My husband and I made a decision. We're going to run the business together. I've been running it by myself. No problem. Young guy gets up. I'm going to stop smoking weed. Another guy gets up. I'm going to stop hanging out with my friends that are doing this. Okay. Well, another guy gets up. We're going to start investing back into the business. All we're doing is taking the profits. One lady, late 30s, like this, is raising her hand. Very attractive, but she's timid. And I said, yes. She gets up. She says, this is very hard for me to say this. I said, what's that? She says, I'm 39 years old, very successful. I've out-earned all the men in my family, all my employees. She runs a hairdress. She does very for high-end type of stuff. She says, all the men I competed with, I beat most of them. I have a nice car. I have a nice house. I got money. But you know what my biggest breakthroughs? I said, what's that? 
I want a husband. Mm. Mm. I want kids. This thing, doing it by yourself, is not worth it. We have to understand that this life of just everything being about you, it's okay if 30% is about you. It's okay if 40% is about you. It's okay if 60% is about you. But let me tell you, that life alone, when the day comes that we're no longer here, you're going to be forgotten all like this. And you say, what the heck did I do with this eight years I had here? So to me, uh, uh, you have to be very careful what philosophy you buy. And today we know what philosophies they're selling. You can't buy it. It's interesting thinking about the family and John, jump in with your comments as well on this. But, you know, thinking about the traditional view of the family in America, um, you know, we know that for the three of us, it's our conviction that God is the one that has established family as the centerpiece for any society. You know, right. God's design for marriage is and family is the way a society flourishes. And, you know, we often talk about, particularly on this program, how the traditional view of the family is on uh, is attacked uh, by the left, by the transgender movement. But recently, it's not only on the attack from the left, but even uh, those that uh, are heter heterosexual, mm -hmm. as you just mentioned, uh, Patrick. Uh, I was listening to an interview of a 45 year old male that was convinced when he was 22 uh, to not have children, not get married, advance in his career. And he opened up uh, and said, it was the biggest regret of my life. I'm wildly successful in business, but I look back, I can't have kids. I, I, I'm, I'm striking out and getting married. All my friends are married and have children mm -hmm. and family. So we're seeing it all over the place, this attack on the family. And I think there's a big price to pay. And, you know, the people sometimes misunderstand the word secular. They think it means non-religious. And, and it's come to mean that, but really from Latin, the word means essentially right now, this present age. To be secular is to be focused only only on the right now and only on this present age. And it seems like that's what we're seeing when it comes to issues like family. You look at Europe, which is a very, uh, you know, to generalize, there are differences among the countries there, but generally very secular. And you see these dropping birth rates and so forth. And it, it actually leads to a civilizational collapse. Patrick, it seems like we've just gotten all twisted up in terms of what's important, uh, substituting that you quoted the Jewish proverb, where it's rooted in an idea of something that will live beyond us, something that's above us, something that's greater than us. It seems like now there's nothing that's greater than us. It's whatever I want to be in this moment, whatever I decide when I wake up, whether I'm male or female, whether I'm married or not, mm. whether I'm a parent, whether I'm not, uh, all of it seems to be up for grabs. Yeah. You know, I have a guy that we do a podcast with. His name is Adam. Uh, he is uh, uh, in his early 40s. He, he, he likes it when I say he's in his late 30s because he's been 39 <laughs> for five years. So if you do Jack the math, he just had a birthday. I think it's his birthday today. <laughs> and we talk about, uh, you know, he's lived in the Miami life. So you know what the Miami lifestyle is. It's mm -hmm. a constant. And he's been in that since he was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. So fast, quick, fun, connected, all of that. I said, you know what's the heaviest word most single men fear and most of us fear is the R word and it's responsibility. Mm. It's annoying. It's an annoying word. It's annoying when you talk about it in business, uh, uh, you know, events. It's annoying when you talk about it with your kids, with your spouse, with your board, with anybody. Nobody. There's nothing attractive about the word responsible. Nothing. It's very hard to sell that concept, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't want responsibility. Here's what I will tell you, though. When you talk about the family nucleus and you're bringing what you're bringing up, I got three things uh, uh, on this topic. One, stats about single parent households, mm. America against the rest of the world, okay? In America, 23% of kids that are raised, they're raised by a single parent, 23%. Now, we know the divorce thing is 50%, but yeah. people remarry. True. But 23% of kids are single parent, okay? The world average is 7.3%. Hmm. India and China are 4 and 3%. We're at 23%, okay? Three times the world average, okay? Mm -hmm. Five, six times, seven times China and India, okay? And, and we're sitting here saying, well, you know, it's just it's, leave them alone. Let people do whatever they want to do. No, it's not working. Yeah. This is not what you took church out of school 
because you feared what? You took prayer out of public schools. I'm going around telling everybody that I can. Every chance I get to speak to people, you know what I tell them? I say, I don't care if you're making 70 grand a year. Go make an additional $3,000 a month, not to buy a nice car, not to buy a nice house, not to buy a nice suit or a nice watch, to put your kids in a Christian private school. I don't care if your kids go to a Jewish private school, a Christian private school, a Catholic private school. I don't care what denomination it is. I just wanted to go to a school where you're going to learn the Bible. You're going to learn the right principles, the values. You're better off putting them there and there and leaving them in public school while Amen. everybody else is Amen. getting confused. Amen. Well, yeah. over the last 50 years, we've bought the lie uh, yeah. from the cultural elites that we need to become secu secular yeah. in our view of marriage and our mm -hmm. view of the public square, politics, government. And we bought this lie that we will be better off as a nation, as a society, will be lifted, liberated from the oppression of these traditional values and traditional views. And I want to ask the country, are we any better off? Any better off yeah. tearing down the traditional view of marriage, traditional view of the family, traditional view of how God intersects all of life in the public school system, in the public square, and we what, look what at the mess we're in today. Let, let me ask you this. You're in this world. Yep. What do you th why do you think they fear prayer? Like, wh what is the fear with praying? What is the fear with pledge allegiance? What is the fear with that in public schools? Because uh, Christianity and the Judeo-Christian worldview represents a, an oppressive system of thought. I mean, that, that's the big lie. So uh, God and his, view and his view of marriage and gender and sexuality and uh, allegiance to him represents a form of oppression. Who sold that first? Like who, you know how, like if you yeah. talk about Affordable Care Act, we think about Obama, right? Mm -hmm. If we think about build that wall, we think about Trump. If we think about, you know, whatever different campaigns, we'll think about a certain president. Who sold that campaign? Who campaigned that? Who sold that concept to the American people where people sell less? Is this, is this a Woodrow Wilson era? Are we going back? What era was this? John, you're our historian. Well, <laughs> you throw that to me. I, you know, I, I, it would be hard to point it down to one exact time. You have the Everson Supreme Court decision in 1947 that essentially says rules prayer out of school. So already this is well underway 47. by 1947. Yeah. Um, I, I think you go back to the Frankfurt School of of thinkers that came over from, from Germany in, in the 1930s even. But you have the seeds of it, I do think, going back to the progressive movement, uh, Woodrow Wilson and, and people like that, where they have this quote-unquote progressive view that says we, you know, one of Wilson's things was we don't, we don't hold ourselves to a hidebound constitution that was written at that point, you know, almost 150 years ago. Um, you know, these people are all dead. We're not in some kind of thrall to a bunch right. of old dead people. Yeah. We need to sort of make this up again for ourselves. And then, uh, you know, you add some evolutionary thinking to that. And, and before you know it, you've got a, a growing culture and a growing academia that says, we need to just sort of rewrite this every few years for ourselves, rewrite our constitution, rewrite our values, rewrite mm. our social mores. And so it's all up for grabs. But I, yeah, it starts after the turn of the century and probably... World War One into World War Two is where you really see it explode. Yeah, and I think not to get into the weeds, but I think when you look at Marxist thought and ideology, yeah. right? Marxist thought is basically class warfare. Yeah. Um, and class warfare spread all throughout Europe. It's started to spread all throughout the world. It, uh, you know, indoctrinated, uh, you know, significant leaders all throughout world history. But I think when you trace the, the roots of Marxism in this country, I think they quickly understood in the 20th century that Marxism will never really take root, especially yeah. the class warfare, because there was too strong of a middle class. Yeah. But what they did is they developed critical theory. And critical theory said, we are going to pit people against each other. Uh, we're going to pit the oppressor and the oppressed against each other. And I think in this conversation in particular, when it comes to God's design for marriage and for family, God's design for uh, how uh, schools and education and government should work, um, the, the Christians and those who hold to a Judeo-Christian worldview are deemed in Marxist ideology and in critical theory mm. as the oppressor. Mm -hmm. So we've got to strip down this archaic, oppressive 
worldview and thinking in order to elevate those that they determine are the oppressed in this nation. And for far too long, those who uh, hold to a Judeo-Christian worldview have been silent, and we have allowed this to happen over 50, 100 years in our nation and our society. And and we're reaping uh, the, you know, the repercussions of it today. I know you've been addressing that, Patrick, uh, a lot of the, this critical theory stuff even and, and the way that it's sort of built this resentment and this sense of oppression and this sense that, uh, you know, somehow I'm being kept down uh, across the board, uh, you know, sexes, genders, races. So, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'm, I'm not a fan of it. You know, for me, we grew up, there's this phrase in Armenian that says mechka, mechka, mechka. It's like, oh... Poor Ra, poor Pastor Ra, <laughs> poor Pap, Mechka, Mech, it's constantly like, and, and you know when people would come over, oh, you guys are poor, let us give you this for Thanksgiving, to, I couldn't stand it, like, I, I couldn't stand even the thought, because when, when somebody wants to say, here, we are, we are here to help you, you you're, you're telling me that I'm not good enough to make it to the next mm. level for whatever reason. It's pity. Yeah, I, I can't stand pity. I, I mean, I can't stand it. There's this book called uh, Power Versus Force. Uh, it's written by a, a guy named David Schwartz. Oprah Winfrey recommended this year. It's not a Christian book. But what he does do is in the book, he explains different levels of consciousness from the lowest to the highest. And the first level where you actually are going to make progress. Lowest level is like apathy, guilt, shame you know, anger, desire, pride, and then you go into courage, which is the first level. You you have the courage to be wrong. You have the courage to speak out. You have the courage to say something. Then it goes to neutrality. Let me hear both sides out. Then you're willing to be wrong. You're willing to talk about it. Then you're able to reason with somebody else. Okay, this makes sense. What about this? And then it goes to love, joy, enlightenment, these levels that he describes, right? When I hear a sales team or a sports team if I go to a sports event, I hear the coach even give a message of fear, apathy, guilt, and even this much of like, oh, but you don't, but it's not fair because they have this, but we're going to, let's give our best. I don't even like that message. I don't like when pastors give it. I don't like when mm. coaches give it. I don't like when business leaders give it. I don't like when podcasts give it. I just don't like it. Yesterday I had Roland Martin on. He was the former guy from CNN. Yeah. And we had a very heated debate, uh, and everybody was reacting. I can't believe you said this. I can't believe you said that. I'm like, I don't want anybody to pin my community to be a victim because somebody is preventing me from winning at the highest level. Mm -hmm. Why is it so many people from other countries come here with little to no money, and within 10 years, they are financially free? They don't have generational wealth. They, they got nothing. They started off with zero. Mm -hmm. Why is it that so many people around the world want to come to America? We lead the world in immigration with 41 million people that come here. I think Germany's two, Russia's three or four, and the numbers go. So when, when you say those types of things, you know, one has to kind of ask themselves and say, okay, if I'm listening to this podcast, do most of my friends around me, do, do we feel we're victims? Do, do most of my, do, do we speak that language with my kids? Do my wife and I, my husband and I, do we speak the language of victim? We got to change this. This does yeah, not produce good. results. Yeah. I, I can't say, did you see the recent movie that came out of Will? You got, yeah. you got, so you know Brandon Fraser who's in it? Mm -hmm. Do you know the sure. story behind it or no, not? No, I don't. Spoiler alert. If you're going to watch it, I'm going to tell you the ending, so don't <laughs> listen right. to this part. Skip it. Uh, but here's this one of the worst movies I've seen uh, uh, in a long time, okay? Uh, you know Million Dollar Baby? I don't know if you remember yes. Million Dollar Baby, how it's it ended. I couldn't stand the way it ended. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. It's like, why am I going to encourage anybody to go watch Million Dollar right. Baby? Hey, let's watch a motivational video, kids. Watch this movie, how it ends. Oh, boom. <laughs> no, I don't like the ending, right? right? So this story about... Uh, 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 whale, Brandon Fraser, who, by the way, does a phenomenal job Yes, acting. he's been nominated for basically and every award. In yeah. the area, in the context of acting, he should win something because yeah. he crushed it, okay? Mm. But let's set that side aside. This has nothing to do with Brandon Fraser. Mm -hmm. This has to do with the story of the movie, okay? So here's a man who's married to his wife, has an eight-year-old daughter, who's a teacher, ends up leaving with one of his uh, students who's a boy, who's a guy, leaves his daughter and his wife behind to go be with this 22-year-old man, boy. And they start a relationship together. The guy's gay. He ends up committing suicide, the boyfriend of his. And his uh, the guy who commits suicide, the sister takes care of him. And Brandon Fraser, who plays the guy, mm -hmm. ends up becoming 600 pounds. And eventually his daughter comes to see him. She has so much resentment. Why did you leave? Why? Did you? She's a troublemaker, but she's smart. 
And he said, let me help you do your homework. So I'm gonna, listen, I have $120,000 I'm going to give you. This is all I can. And I saved it all for you. Your mom didn't tell, but this is all your money. I'll give it to you. And at the end, the daughter's like, why don't you try to lose weight? Why don't you try to change? Why don't you try to do something? No, it's not like that. It's not like the movie ends with him dying, but the daughter gets money and it's sold as he made the right decision to give up on the dog. What are we talking about mm. here? And this is a movie that we're selling as a great movie. If you want to really persuade people and get people thinking, oh, look at this movie. What a good... Give up on your kids. Mm. Give up on your kids. It's money is more important. I think said money isn't important. So the so same people that are saying money isn't important, that message of that movie is, here's $120,000, my daughter. This is my way of showing you love. That's not the way you show love. That girl wants to walk down the aisle with the dad. Yeah. That girl wants to have a relationship with the dad. That, that, that girl wants to argue with dad about different topics. You took that away from her. There's no man that could replace that emotion mm -hmm. blood has for another blood. So it drives me insane when I see the messaging that we have. I think Hollywood uh, has been able to manipulate and brainwash so many of us by making these movies and people are falling for it. So I think there needs to be a direct competitor on the other side. There's a lot of people that are doing it. You got some people that are investing billions of dollars into doing it. I hope they continue with it. But the, yeah, the messaging today is strange and a lot of people are buying into it. Well, that's all for part one of our interview with Patrick Bet David. Be sure to listen next week as we will show you part two of this fascinating interview. I want to thank you for listening to the City of God podcast, which is made in partnership with the Institute for Faith and Culture. This is a weekly podcast, so make sure that you are not only tuning in each week, but going back and listening to our previous podcast. You can go to cityofgodpodcast.com, a city of God podcast.com. Also make sure you find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And also you can watch the video version of this podcast and all previous podcasts on our YouTube page. I want to thank you for listening and may God richly bless you.